This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Check out our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, at youtube.com slash UCTV Prime. Subscribe today to get new programs every week. I, 
produce the uh, fixed margin level. So let's start off with something fairly well understood, ordinary stars. Does their brilliance and color depend on their mass, their age, or on what they're made of? How do they evolve? What fuel keeps them shining? And what happens when that fuel runs out? The life cycle of our sun, a typical star, is illustrated here, courtesy of National Geographic magazine. What this shows is an artist's impression, time-lapse picture, where the interval between successive frames is about 100 million, 10 to the 8 years. The sun started by condensing from an interstellar cloud, contracting till it said it got hot enough to ignite the fusion of hydrogen to helium. This process has kept it shining stably for about 4.5 billion years. The hydrogen in the core will run out after about another 5 billion years. It will then flare up into a red giant, becoming large enough to engulf the inner planets and to vaporize all life on Earth. After the red giant phase, then the uh, center of the star will condense to become a sort of dense cinder, a white dwarf, no larger than the Earth, though nearly a million times more massive. We're quite confident about these calculations because the physics involved has been well studied in the lab. It's atomic and nuclear physics, Newtonian gravity, and so forth. We can just as easily compute the life cycle of stars with, say, half the sun's mass, twice the sun's mass, four times, etc. And we find that heavier stars burn more brightly and trace out their life cycle more quickly. Well, so we say, but how can these claims be tested? Stars live so long compared to astronomers that we're granted just a single snapshot of each one's life. But we can test our theories by looking at the whole population of stars. Just as trees live for hundreds of years, but even if you've never seen a tree before, it would take no more, more than an afternoon wandering around in a forest to deduce the life cycle of trees. From looking at saplings, fully grown specimens, and some which had died. In, for instance, the Iran Nebula, next slide please, uh, new stars are even now condensing within glowing that gas clouds. And the best test beds for checking such calculations, next slide, are the stellar populations in globular clusters. Swarms of up to a million stars of different sizes held together by their mutual gravity, which all formed at the same time. But not everything in the cosmos happens slowly. Next slide. Sometimes stars explode catastrophically, a supernova. And the nearest 20th century supernova occurred in the Magellanic Clouds when this star flared up in 1987. And this particular event, the sudden brightening and gradual fading, was followed not only by optical astronomers, but by those using other modern techniques radio, X-ray, and gamma-ray telescopes, which have opened new windows on the universe. In about a 1,000 years, it will look like the next one, the Crab Nebula, which is the relic of a supernova, which was recorded by Chinese astronomers in the year 1054 AD. And now, nearly a 1,000 years later, we see the expanding debris from this explosion. This nebula will remain visible, gradually expanding and fading for a few thousand years more. It will then become so diffuse that it merges with the very dilute gas and dust that pervades interstellar space. Next slide shows another star, a swirling outflow in a kind of slower motion supernova. Supernovae fascinate astronomers, but why should anyone else care about explosions thousands of light years away? The answer is, that were it not for supernovae, the complexities of life on Earth could never have emerged, and we certainly wouldn't be here. <coughs> of the 92 elements that occur naturally on the Earth, some are vastly more common than others. For every 10 atoms of carbon, you find about 20 of oxygen, about five each of nitrogen and iron. But gold is a million times rarer than oxygen, and others, Platinum and Mercury are rarer still. 
and of course the most important ingredients of living things, ourselves included, are carbon and oxygen atoms, linked along with others into long chain-like molecules of huge complexity. We couldn't exist if these particular atoms weren't common on Earth. So why are carbon and oxygen common, but gold and uranium so rare? This everyday question isn't unanswerable, but the answer involves ancient stars that exploded in our Milky Way more than five billion years ago, before our solar system formed. Stars much heavier than the sun evolve faster and in a more complicated and dramatic way. Next slide. After they've used up their central hydrogen and turned that into helium, gravity squeezes them further. Their centers then get still hotter until helium atoms themselves stick together to make the nuclei of heavier elements. Carbon, six protons, oxygen, eight protons, and iron, 26 protons. So a kind of onion skin develops where the inner hotter layers have been processed, transmuted further up the periodic table. When their fuels all be consumed, and when the hot centers are transmuted into iron, big stars face a crisis. A catastrophic infall squeezes their centers to the density of an atomic nucleus, triggering a colossal explosion that blows off the outer layers. And this explosion is what manifests itself as a supernova of the kind that made the crab nebula. So the debris contains the outcome of all the nuclear alchemy that kept the star shining over its lifetime. A lot of oxygen and carbon, traces of many other elements. And the calculated mix is gratifyingly close to the proportions we now observe in our solar system. Next slide. The Milky Way, our home galaxy, resembles therefore a kind of giant ecosystem. Crystalline hydrogen is transmuted inside stars into the basic building blocks of life. Carbon, oxygen, iron, and all the rest. Some of this material returns to interstellar space, thereafter to be recycled into new generations of stars. A carbon atom forged in an early supernova might wander for hundreds of millions of years in interstellar space. It might then find itself in a dense interstellar cloud which collapses under its own gravity to form new stars. It may then have entered the core of a massive star to be processed further up the periodic table, to silicon or into iron. It might then be flung out in another supernova, or it may have joined one of the less massive stars, each surrounded by a spinning gaseous disk that condenses into a retinue of planets. And one such star was our sun, and the atom may have found itself in a newly forming Earth, perhaps eventually in a human cell like ours. So each atom has a pedigree extending back earlier than our solar system's birth four and a half billion years ago. The solar system itself condensed from the intermingled debris of many earlier stars. There's nothing special about our sun, but what about the life on a planet around it? Astronomers are confident that planets exist around many other stars, perhaps even most. And a lot of those planets might resemble the young Earth. But given the right environment, what's the chance that life gets started? And how likely is simple life to evolve into anything that can be called intelligent? Now that's a question for biologists. And biology is a much harder subject than astronomy. And even the experts don't agree on whether complex life is a likely or an unlikely outcome. Next slide. The chances of intelligent life elsewhere may be small. And if it did exist, it may take forms we wouldn't recognize. The most intelligent beings may lead purely contemplative lives and have no motive for sing signaling their presence to us at all. And even if signals were being transmitted, the cultural gap may be so unbridgeable that we couldn't recognize them. But despite the heavy odds against success, a systematic search is a worthwhile gamble because any signal of plainly artificial origin, even if it message made little sense to us, would plainly have tremendous input. And the limited programs to search for extra intelligence, called SETI, seem to be worthwhile, even though they have a hard time getting public funding 
I suspect because the topic's encumbered by manifestly flaky connotations, UFOs and so forth. But to surely more widely diffuse public interest in this quest than in any traditional branch of physics or astronomy. And if I was a US citizen, I'd feel more comfortable advocating $10 million for a SETI program than arguing for a $10 billion particle accelerator. But that's a controversial statement, I'm sure. <laughs> the odds may be stacked so heavily against intelligent life that there's no other site in our galaxy anywhere where it's developed. Maybe even no site in our observable universe. Some might find it depressing if we were alone in a vast inanimate cosmos, but I personally react like the opposite way. Because although it would be disappointing if a SETI search were doomed to failure, we could then envisage our Earth in a less humble cosmic perspective than it would merit if the universe already teemed with life. To appreciate this perspective, we must conceptualize just how far the sun's life extends into the future as well as into the past. I showed this on an earlier slide, but just recall uh, an analogy. Supposing America had existed forever and you were walking across it, starting on the east coast when the earth formed, ending up here 10 billion years later when the sun's about to die. To make this journey, you'd have to take one step every 2,000 years. All recorded history would be three or four steps just before the halfway stage, somewhere in Minnesota maybe. And that's not the culmination of a journey. So in that cosmic perspective, we are still near Darwin's simple beginning of the evolutionary process. The progression towards diversity has much further to go. Even if life is now unique to the Earth, there's time for it to spread from here through the entire galaxy and even beyond if, if the Earth's biosphere isn't snuffed out now. And if it was snuffed out, then potentialities of truly cosmic proportions would, in this scenario, be foreclosed. Well, that was a digression. But I've tried to indicate how the Earth and everything on it is the outcome of recycling processes over the history of our Milky Way galaxy, how we are literally the ashes of long dead stars. But how did our galaxy itself emerge? And where did the basic hydrogen come from? To answer these questions, we must broaden our horizons still further in both space and time. Next slide. Our Milky Way, with its 100 billion stars, and a scale of 100,000 light years is just one galaxy, similar to the Andromeda galaxy and millions of others which we see with our telescopes. Each galaxy is held together by gravity. Each is a kind of ecosystem which is the same recycling process are going on as in ours. Astronomers, I'm afraid, have to admit that they don't understand why galaxies exist why these distinctive aggregates are the most conspicuous features of the large-scale universe. I'll say a bit more next week about galaxies, what they're made of and how they're clustered. But in the perspective of cosmologists, even entire galaxies, huge though they are, are just like test particles, which tell us how the material constant of the universe is distributed and how it moves. Next slide. Galaxies are grouped in clusters, like this one here, and even into superclusters. You might ask, are we in a universe that contained clusters of clusters of clusters ad infinitum? Next slide. Light is shown here, what in modern jargon we call a fractal. In fact, we know our universe isn't like that, because if it was, however deep we looked into space, we'd see conspicuous patchiness over the sky. We'd be seeing a larger scale of a hierarchy, but the universe would never look smooth. But in fact, next slide, if we look deep enough, the universe looks fairly smooth. This is the nearest million galaxies around us. You see some clusters, but they're fairly smooth. And if you could probe still deeper, you would find clustering less evident and the sky appearing smoother. So there is a well-defined sense in which the universe is roughly homogeneous. A terrestrial analogy may clarify this. From a vantage point far out of sight of land, a view of the ocean looks very complex. You 
You see waves, small riding on large, a lot of foam, etc. But once your gaze extends beyond the scale of the biggest ocean swells, you see an overall uniformity, stretching to the horizon many miles away. A patch of ocean large enough to be typical must extend several times further than the scale of the biggest waves. But this can still be small compared with the expansive ocean we can see. Our horizon extends far enough to encompass many patches of ocean, similar one to another, each large enough to be a fair sum. This broad brush uniformity of seascapes is, of course, not a feature of landscapes. On land, progressively larger mountain peaks may stretch all the way to the horizon, and a single topographical feature may dominate the entire view. Cosmology has only progressed because our observable universe, the volume out to the horizon of our observations, resembled a seascape and not a mountain landscape in this sense. Even the bigger superclusters are still small compared to the range of our powerful telescopes. So we can define the average smoothed out properties of our observable universe. But cosmology is, by definition, the study of the entire universe we can see. And we can see only one universe, probably indeed only a tiny part of everything there is. And no physicist would happily base a theory on a single unrepeatable experiment. No biologist would formulate general ideas on animal behavior after observing just one rat, which might have hangouts peculiar to itself. But we can't directly check our ideas on cosmology by looking at other universes. But despite this limitation, scientific cosmology has progressed but only because our observed universe in its large-scale structure is simpler and smoother than we had any right to expect. Next slide. The overall motions in our universe are simple too. As Hubble first realized, next slide, distant galaxies we see from us with a speed proportional to their distance. The length of the arrows here symbolizes a speed, as though they all started off packed together 10 or 15 billion years ago. There's no real center. It's like this lattice. Next slide. This is an Escher picture. If you imagine the rods all lengthened at the same rate, the vertices would recede in accordance with Hubble law. No vertex is special. And that's actually quite a good analogy for the expanding universe, except that the galaxies aren't regularly spaced, like the vertices of the lattice but they do expand in this simple, uniform way. So did everything really start with the so-called Big Bang? This idea goes back to the Belgian Catholic priest, George Lemaitre. Next slide. There he is. And in 1930, he wrote, the evolution of the universe could be compared to a display of fireworks that has just ended. Some few wisps, ashes, and smoke. Standing on a Welsh chill cinder, we see the slow fading of the suns, and we try to recall the vanished brilliance of the origin of the worlds. But are there any surviving traces of that vanished brilliance? Well, as everyone here knows, the clinching evidence came back in 1965, when Penges and Wilson, next slide, found excess microwave noise coming equally from all directions and with no obvious source in their antenna, the Bell Telephone Labs. This had momentous implications. It implied that intergalactic space wasn't completely cold. It was about three degrees above absolute zero. And this cosmic background is a relic of an epoch when the entire universe was hot, dense, and opaque. As the universe expanded, the radiation from this primordial fireball would have cooled and diluted each wavelength would have stretched, but it would still be around. It fills the universe, it's got nowhere else to go. And the most distinctive and lasting achievement of NASA's COBE satellite, though maybe not the most important, has been to show that the spectrum of this radiation, which I've shown here as a crude black body curve, is actually a precise thermal black body with a precision of about one part in 10,000. 
the temperature is actually 2.726 degrees. And this radiation is therefore a fossil of the early universe, and it hasn't been substantially distorted by any later process. In a few moments, I want to come back again to our universe's hot, dense beginnings. But let's now go forward rather than backward, like forecasters rather than fossil hunters. What about the future? In about five billion years, the sun will die, and the Earth with it. At about the same time, give or take a billion years, the Andromeda galaxy, already falling towards us, will crash into our Milky Way and merge with it, forming a single amorphous elliptical galaxy. But will the universe go on expanding forever, or will it recollapse? so that our remote descendants all share the fate of an astronaut who falls into a black hole, the firmament falling on their heads to recreate a fireball like that with which our universe began. The galaxies are, as it were, the fragments of the expanding universe. And we know their expansion speed. We know also that everything in the universe exerts a gravitational pull on everything else. It is easy to calculate that gravity would eventually bring the expansion to a halt if the average cosmic density exceeded a so-called critical value of about three atoms in every cubic meter. And in my lecture next week, I'll say a bit more about the so-called dark matter that might or might not supply this density and what it might be. But the bottom line is that we don't know whether there's enough of it to make up the full critical density, still less whether there could be more. So let's consider briefly the two scenarios for the long-term future of our universe. Next slide. Suppose the present density were more than the critical value. The expansion would then eventually stop. Galaxies would then fall back towards one another, their red shifts being replaced by blue shifts. Space is already becoming punctured by the black holes that form from collapse of massive dying stars, or the processes that create the power in quasars. These events would then just be precursors of a universal squeeze that engulfs everything. And this slide describes the countdown to the crunch, as it were. In the last 100 million years, minus 10 to the 8th, sorry, can we, could we go on? Next slide, please. Yep, sorry. Um, uh, this is the countdown, um, and we see that the remaining stars for the last 100 billion years are no longer attached to their parent galaxy. They move freely everywhere. As the countdown proceeds, the stars move faster as the galaxy uh, gets destroyed, and the stars are like the atoms in a box that's being compressed. Eventually, the stars will be shattered by colliding with each other. But a different process would have destroyed them first. The sky, brightened by the blue shifted radiation from everything else, would become brighter than the stars themselves. Stars then gain heat faster than they get rid of it. They get cooked in an oven, as it were, even hotter than their surfaces. They puff up and disperse into gas. So that's the way the stars get destroyed. The earliest this big crunch could happen would be 50 billion years from now. So the breathing space is at least 10 times the future lifetime of the sun. And most theorists, in fact, believe that the density of the universe is at most very slightly higher than the critical density. So if there is a big crunch, it will actually be vastly further in the future, even than 50 billion years. So let that be a reassuring thought. <laughs> Suppose, though, that there isn't enough gravitating stuff ever to halt the expansion. Could we go back one slide now, please? What will happen then is that there will be enough time for all stars and all galaxies to attain a terminal equilibrium. The sky would get blacker and blacker as galaxies fade and disperse ever more thinly throughout the expanding space. It's thought that atoms may not last forever, but only for maybe 10 to the 35 years. So if the expansion went on long enough, then dead stars, white dwarfs and neutron stars, would dissolve and decay. Black holes would survive, but even they don't live forever. They shed energy by the so-called Hawking evaporation process, which would take about 10 to 66 years to 
get rid of that hose. But an ever-expanding universe provides enough time for this to happen, even for evaporation of the ultramassive black holes, as heavy as millions of stars that build up in the centers of galaxies. It's still uncertain whether particles indeed decay. And if they don't, the final heat death would be spun out over a much longer period. A neutron star could tunnel into a black hole by quantum effects. This immensely improbable event, 10 to the 57 atoms quantum jumping in unison, would not be expected until after a time so enormous that if written down in full, it involves the number of zeros equal to the number of atoms in the universe. If the universe is made of ink, you could never write down that number. And that's the time it would take for the universe to get to its terminal equilibrium. And then the black holes would evaporate in a time which, in that perspective, is almost instantaneous. Freeman Dyson was the first person to write seriously about the long-range future. He didn't discuss the recollapsing big crunch. He said it gave him claustrophobia. But he speculated about the really long-term prospects for intelligence in an ever-expanding universe, long after the stars had died. He asked, can life survive and develop intellectually forever, storing an ever-increasing body of information with finite energy reserves? His answer was yes. But as the background temperature falls, any form of life or intelligence would have to keep cool, think more and more slowly, and hibernate for long intervals. You could imagine hugely complex but tenuous networks. There are, in principle, quite general limits on how big and complex any organisms, or indeed any computers, can get. Because anything too large would be crushed by gravity, and its internal workings would generate too much power to be radiated away. But hypothetical structures in the far future can transcend both these constraints. However massive they are, gravity can be suppressed by making them distended enough. They can have a large enough surface to radiate and stay almost as cool as the background radiation, whose temperature drops lower and lower as the expansion goes on. The minimum energy needed to transmit each bit of information then gets lower. A very spread out configuration would operate slowly. Information processing or thinking uh, rates are limited by how long it takes the signal moving at the speed of light to get across the computer. And this, of course, is why computers are made as compact as possible. But speed is not a priority when these aeons stretch ahead. So much then for the far future, what theologians call eschatology. Next slide, for one, please. Next. If you're of an apocalyptic temperament and you can't wait 100 billion years, then head for a black hole. You can there encounter a foretaste of the big crunch, created by local gravitational collapse. Black holes form when heavy stars die, perhaps after some supernova. And there may be many of these black holes in our Milky Way. But more spectacularly, monster black holes, each weighing hundreds of millions of suns, may exist as the relics of the events that form quasars. And they may lurk in the centers of some galaxies. Next one, please. There's one in this galaxy, Centaurus A. So you should aim preferably for one of these large black holes. They're so capacious that even after falling inside, you would have several hours for leisured observation before you were torn apart right in the middle. But a more cautious course would be to remain in orbit just outside the hole. From that vantage point, if the hole was spinning fast, you'd be safe but you'd have a blue shift in a speeded up preview of the entire future of the external universe in what to you would seem quite a short time. Next slide. These two scenarios, which I've sketched, perpetual expansion or recollapse to a crunch, seem very different. But the initial conditions that could have led to anything like our present universe are actually highly restrictive compared to the possible universes that you might imagine setting up. Our universe is still expanding after 10 billion years. So if you plot the length of the rods in Escher's lattice after 10 billion years, 
still going up. We don't know whether it will collapse again or go and expand it forever. But had the universe recollapsed sooner, there'd be no time for stars to form, maybe even no time for anything to get out of thermal equilibrium. On the other hand, if the expansion was much faster than it actually is, then galaxies could never have pulled themselves together under gravity because the kinetic energy would have been so great. So the early universe seems somehow to have been rather finely tuned. In Newtonian terms, the initial potential and kinetic energy must have been very closely matched. It's like sitting at the bottom of a well and throwing up a stone so that it just comes to a halt exactly at the top. So why was the universe set up expanding in this special way, rather than expanding too fast or recollapsing very soon? Most cosmologists hold that this question does have an answer, but the clues lie right back in the initial instance of the Big Bang. It was right back then that the apparent fine-tuning in the expansion rate was imprinted. And this unknown physics would perhaps have fixed the other basic forces. I'll say a bit more about this next week, but now I'll say a word about gravity, the most important force on the cosmic scale. Gravity seems, along with the electric and nuclear forces that govern the microphysical world, to have a universal and unvarying strength everywhere in the universe that we can observe. But is there anything special about its actual strength? If gravity was, say, twice as strong, stars would be smaller and they'd burn more brightly. But they wouldn't differ in any really drastic, qualitative way. However, compared to microphysical forces, gravity is exceedingly weak. In a hydrogen atom, that's two protons, the gravitational force between the protons is 36 powers of 10 weaker than the electric force between them. But on large scales, gravity wins and holds us down here on the Earth because everything has, as it were, the same sign of gravitational charge. There's no cancellation of positive and negative, like for electricity. To develop this further, the next slide is the only mathematics we're going to get in this talk. Suppose you start off with a single molecule, and then imagine lumps containing successively 10, 100, and 1,000 atoms and cell walls. The 24th, containing 10 to 24 atoms, will be about the size of a sugar lump. The 40th would be a mountain or small asteroid. Now, the gravitational energy of each lump goes as gm over r. And the radius or scale of the lump goes like the cube root of the number of things in it. Radius goes like a cube root of volume. So gm over r goes up like a two-thirds power of the number. Now, gravity starts off with a handicap of 36 powers of 10. It gains as the two-thirds power of that number. So when we have a lump containing 10 to the 54, atoms, 54 being 36 times 3 halves, then gravity's made up the handicap. And anything larger than that, which happens to be about the mass of Jupiter, would be crushed by gravity and would become a star. So from this argument, you can see that because gravity is so handicapped, gravity only becomes important when large numbers of particles are packed together, and the number you need goes to the 3 halves power of the large number reflecting the weakness of gravity. Suppose we had an imaginary universe where gravity was, say, 10 to the 10th times stronger than it is now. Suppose that it was 10 to the minus 26, not 10 to the minus 36 times weaker than electrical forces. But suppose that the microphysics was unchanged. Then you could go through this argument, and you would find that you could have stars, gravitationally confined fusion reactors, which would still exist, but their masses would be down by 10 to the 15, 3 halves power, 10 to the 10th factor, compared to present day stars. Moreover, you can calculate, though I won't go through it, that the lifetime of these stars would be down by 10 to the 10th. So we'd have these miniature stars living for only one year. And one other thing, if gravity were 10 to the 10th stronger, 
We could have this miniature universe, miniature stars, miniature solar systems, but no animals on any planet large enough to retain an atmosphere could be any bigger than insects. And even they would need very thick legs to support themselves against this strong gravity. So if gravity wasn't quite so weak as it is in our universe, the literally crushing effect of the strong gravity would restrict the scope of complex evolution. But more severe still is a limited time. Chemical and metabolic processes depend just on microphysics, and they wouldn't be speeded up. But the mini sun would burn faster and would have exhausted its energy before even the first steps in organic evolution could have got underway. So paradoxically, the weaker gravity is, the closer its strength is to zero, provided it's not exactly zero, the grander and more complex can be its consequences. It's because gravity is so weak that structures which are important to astronomers have to be so colossal for it to compete with the other forces. Gravity is essential for cosmic evolution for another reason, connected with thermodynamics. People often wonder how the universe can have started off in thermal equilibrium as a dense fireball and ended up so conspicuously far from equilibrium. It seems contrary to thermodynamic intuitions. But gravity has a peculiar property. It drives things further from equilibrium. When gravitating systems lose energy, they get hotter, not cooler. A familiar instance of this is the way an artificial satellite speeds up as it spirals downward due to atmospheric drag. Only half the gravitational energy released as it falls downwards goes into heat, the other half goes into speeding it up. And stars offer another example. A star that loses energy and deflates ends up with a hotter center than before. To establish a new and more compact equilibrium where pressure can hold it up against this stronger gravity, the central temperature has to rise. So while our universe expanded, it started off in a fireball state, but regions that started off only slightly denser than average would have lagged behind more and more and eventually stopped expanding. They were pulled together to make gaseous proto-galaxies, which then fragmented into stars. An expanding universe ends up diffuse and transparent, so the resulting temperature differences between these stars and the, and the region between them don't get washed out as they did in the early universe. And temperatures in our universe therefore range, range from the blazing surfaces of stars, and even hotter stuff inside them, to the night sky, only three degrees above absolute zero. In fact, if you had to summarize in just one sentence what's been happening since the Big Bang, the best answer might be to take a deep breath and say, ever since the beginning, the anti-thermodynamic effects of gravity have been amplifying inhomogeneities and creating progressively steeper temperature gradients, a prerequisite for emergence of the complexity that lies around us 10 billion years later. Gravity's precise strength isn't crucial. It just has to be incredibly weak compared to the other forces. But the other forces, those in microphysics, do seem to have been set up so that a rather delicate balance prevails. And this is something we don't understand. In the nucleus of an atom, for instance, there is such a balance between the two forces which govern its constituent protons and neutrons. The electric propulsion, between the protons and the strong nuclear force that creates a counterbalancing attraction. If nuclear forces were slightly weaker, no chemical elements other than hydrogen would be stable. Chemistry would be a trivially simple subject. <laughs> but if the nuclear forces were slightly stronger than they actually are compared to electromagnetism, then two protons could stick together so readily that ordinary hydrogen wouldn't exist, and stars would evolve quite differently. Fine-tuning arguments like this have a long pedigree. They trace back, in fact, to classic theological arguments for an intelligent or even benign creator. And the most celebrated expositor of these was William Paley, whose book Natural Theology, published in 1802, introduced the famous analogy of the watch and the watchmaker. Paley's arguments, though, mainly from biology, retain little interest, even for theologians, in the post-Darwinian intellectual climate. Had Paley been writing today, in the light of current ideas on the Earth's place in its broader cosmic environment, he'd have been equally impressed 
by the astrophysical as well as terrestrial accidents on which our emergence seems to hinge. He did consider it remarkable that, as Fred Hoyle realized in the 1950s, carbon can be made in stars along with oxygen only because of a very specially placed resonance, a special feature in the carbon nucleus. And this fine tuning in cosmology refers to basic physics and chemistry. It can't be as readily discounted as Paley's concerning the fitness of animals and plants for their environment. Any complex biological contrivance is the outcome of a long process of evolutionary selection involving symbiosis with its surroundings. But the basic laws governing stars and atoms are given, and nothing biological can react back on them and modify them. So if you imagine a sort of cosmic being turning knobs to vary the basic forces and masses, and constructing a whole ensemble of universes governed by different laws, then clearly we wouldn't be at home in most of the others. And that's trivially obvious. But what's less trivial is the realization that most universes would be still born, in that the laws prevailing in them wouldn't allow any complexity to emerge. For instance, the physics might preclude any chemical elements other than hydrogen, the universe might never deviate from thermodynamic equilibrium, or because gravity was too strong, might exist for too short a time, or more radically, have only two spatial dimensions. If there's more time, I can give more examples. Well, how do we react to this line of thought? Its implications depend very starkly, I think, on what the final theory, if there is one, is like. There are two very different possibilities. One possibility, I'll call it option one, is that some such final theory fixes all the physical constants uniquely, in that they are all calculable from some fundamental equation. The physics governing our universe could not then have been otherwise than the way it is. It would then just be a brute fact that the uniquely specified physical constants happen to lie in the narrowly restricted range that allowed complexity and consciousness to evolve in the low energy world we inhabit. The intricate consequences implicit in those fundamental equations may astonish us, but our amazement will be just as subjective as that of a mathematician who is surprised at the intricate consequences of a simple algorithm. Take, for instance, the famous Mandelbrot set. Next slide. And the next three slides after that. I think everyone knows this, but the rest of your algorithm for constructing this astonishing pattern can be written in just a few lines. Next three slides, please. But that simple algorithm encodes infinite richness, richness of structure on smaller and smaller scales. So in option one, if there's a unique uh, final theory determining the constants of physics uniquely, the fine tuning would just have to be coincidence, or you may say it's providence. But as an alternative, let's call it option B, or option two, which I find more compelling. Maybe what we call the constants of physics aren't uniquely fixed by the fundamental theory. In fact, a key ingredient of most current theorizing is the idea that all the fundamental forces, gravity, nuclear, and electromagnetic, are different aspects of a single primeval force. The forces become differentiated when the universe undergoes phase transitions in the very early stages of its cooling. The imprint left by these phase transitions present-day forces may then be somehow arbitrary or accidental, like the patterns of ice on a pond or the way a magnet behaves when cooled. These same theories have another important cosmological consequence, which I'll come back to next week. There may be an early era when the universe inflates or expands exponentially. This inflation hypothesis can account for the apparent fine-tuning in the expansion rate, which I mentioned earlier. It indeed suggests that the expansion is destined to continue forever, or at least for a vastly longer time, and that our observable universe is an infinitesimal part of everything there is. To recall my ocean analogy, the ocean may seem uniform within our horizon, only a few miles away. That doesn't mean the ocean extends featureless to infinity. A few hundred miles away, the weather may be stormier or calmer. The waves may look quite different. A thousand miles away, the ocean may be bounded by our shoreline. So maybe there are other domains that would never come into view. Next slide, please. Next. 
Uh, it may be that our observable universe uh, is just uh, this region here, and far beyond it, there's more of the same which will never come into view. But according to some ideas, particularly those first mentioned by Sakharov and developed by Andre Linde, there may be other domains that would never come into view, separate regions of space-time, each closing up on itself, which could have been made in the big crunch or made in black holes. And according to Linde's notion, our universe is on the next slide. What I showed in the last slide is just down here, but that's just a little patch in some much vaster uh, domain, which is just one element of an ensemble. So this universe, rather than being everything there is, is just a bubble linked to others in the infinite, eternally replicating ensemble, which you might call a meta-universe. The concept of an ensemble of universes accords with the current inflationary ideas about the early universe. Our patch, or our member of the cosmic ensemble, must then be at least 10 billion light years across, with the physical laws are the same everywhere we can observe. Now, if this picture were correct, the apparent fine tuning needn't surprise us at all. If the constants were the outcome of random accidents, as they are in my option B, then in a sufficiently capacious ensemble or meta-universe, there be some universes where the physics is bound to be propitious for complexity to evolve. We're clearly not surprised to find ourselves in one of these. If a clothes shop has a large stock, you're not surprised if it's one suit that fits. As some of you may realize, I've strayed into what's called anthropic reasoning. And perhaps fortunately, there's no time for me to stray much further. <laughs> but just as Mark Twain said that Wagner's music is better than it sounds, I think anthropic reasoning is less silly or vacuous than it sometimes may to sound. We wouldn't be here if things were otherwise. But that need not quench our curiosity about why the world is as it is. The Canadian philosopher John Leslie has given a neat analogy. Suppose you're facing execution by a 50-man firing squad. The bullets are fired. You find they've all failed to hit their target. Had they not done so, you wouldn't survive to ponder the matter. But realizing realize you are alive, you are legitimately perplexed, and you seek some reason why. And I think anthropic reason gives us extra grounds for suspecting that any final theory will indeed have the permissive character of option two, rather than specifying the physics uniquely as in option one. So it makes a prediction about the nature of the final theory. Just a brief concluding perspective on cosmology's scope and limits. Cosmology is an ancient pursuit. There's not even anything new about the idea of other universes. In fact, it's salutary to contrast Linde's ensemble of universes with my next slide. This dates from 1750. It comes from a marvelous book entitled An Original Theory of the Universe, written and illustrated by Thomas Wright of Durham. The drawing depicts, rather like Linde's, an ensemble of universes. And Wright's caption to it reads, As the visible creation is full of sidereal systems and planetary worlds, so the endless immensity is an unlimited plenum of creations, not unlike the known universe. But cosmology, as a real science, is of course a more modern thing. Astronomical technology has only recently allowed us to probe cosmic evolution right back to eras before galaxies formed. Physicists have only recently gained enough confidence to explore the initial Big Bang and even to suggest how the actual physical laws in some sense emerged with our universe. My last slide shows Einstein. This is a young Einstein, not the benign and unkempt sage of poster and t-shirt. One of his best known remarks one of his cliches, actually, is the most incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it is comprehensible. The laws of physics we study in the lab apply in the remotest quasar, and even in the first few seconds of the Big Bang. Were this not so, were there not a firm link with terrestrial science, the scientific status of cosmology would indeed be shaken. 
Maybe the physics of our universe and others will one day be triumphantly subsumed into some overarching unified theory. I've argued that the most attractive such theory would be one that didn't uniquely predict the physics of everyday world. Such a theory would, though, be hard to check and may never be taken too seriously unless it has some compelling inevitability about it, some resounding ring of truth. But it's worth stressing that a final theory wouldn't help us to untangle the complexities of later cosmic evolution. Chemistry and biology may be reducible to physics in principle, but Schrodinger's equation can't in practice be solved for anything more complicated than a single molecule. The sciences are in a hierarchy of complexity, from particle physics, through chemistry and cell biology, to psychology and ecology. But each of these sciences is autonomous. It depends on its own set of concepts that can't in practice be analyzed into those of a science, a science lower in the hierarchy. The sciences are linked together, but not into a structure where everything is imperiled by uncertainty in the foundations. And actually, no scientists apart from cosmology are seriously incommoded by current uncertainties about the subnuclear world. And these limitations are well described by one of Richard Feynman's favorite metaphors, with which I'll close. Suppose you were unfamiliar with the game of chess. Then, just by watching it being played, you could gradually infer the rules of the game. The physicist, likewise, finds patterns in the natural world and learns what dynamics, what transformations govern its basic elements. But in chess, learning how the pieces move is just a trivial preliminary to the absorbing progression from being a novice to being a grandmaster. The whole fascination of that game lies in the variety implicit in a few simple rules. Likewise, all that's happened in the universe over the last 10 million years, the emergence of galaxies and stars, and the intricate evolution on a planet around at least one star has led to creatures able to wonder about it all, may be implicit in a few fundamental equations, but exploring this complexity offers an unending challenge that's barely begun. Thank you. Regarding quantum cosmology, uh, that is, uh, of course, uh, even more speculative than the ideas of going into inflation, um, but that certainly is relevant to this issue of how strong gravity is, why gravity is weak compared to the other forces, but also is relevant to the question of whether we are in a universe that's finite or goes on forever. Uh, is there the possibility of a, a very small black hole the nucleus of the Earth, therefore? Planets are energy and matter that are drawn to miniature black holes and waxing the planets? Well, it's certainly possible that there are uh, black holes left over the early universe. They're a possible candidate for the dark matter, which I'll say a bit more about next week. Uh, I don't think there could be a black hole inside the Earth. Uh, if there was, it would have uh, gobbled up the Earth long ago. People have worked this out, and uh, uh, it would take quite a short time for the Earth to be, uh, uh, to be eaten uh, if the black hole was uh, larger than a fraction of a, uh, it was much larger than an elementary particle. 
But it is, it's interesting that uh, black holes, which are the size of elementary particles, um, are in fact already quite heavy. Uh, they weigh about as much as a mountain. And that's actually um, related to this large number, which I mentioned, 10 to the 36. Um, if you want to have a black hole the size of a proton, then you have to pack together into that region 10 to the 36 proton masses. And that's essentially because uh, gravity is so weak that the mass has to make up for it. So the mass of a black hole the size of a proton is the mass of 10 to 36 protons, which is about the mass of a mountain. Is there a possibility of a black hole the nucleus of every atom in our body? Uh, I don't think so, no. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Mm. Can, 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 I mean, you have a critical mass. Can you explore about this cosmology that is just a series of big bangs? Um, well, uh, the, the most popular view in cosmology is that the universe has uh, the, the so-called critical density, or maybe just slightly above it. So the universe will go on expanding for a vastly longer time in the future than it has up till now. If there's a big crunch, it's not 50 billion years from now, but vastly further into the future when all uh, matter has decayed. Um, now, whether that uh, huge universe is just one part of an ensemble of other universes, again, we don't know. But it's interesting that there are some uh, formulations of the physics of the early universe which do allow this option. So, although the physics of these very early phases of the universe is it is still very speculative in that we don't have a firm foothold in testable laboratory physics, then there are detailed theories which allow us to calculate uh, what the properties of the early universe were and whether the universe would expand forever or not. And the popular view is that the universe has probably just about the critical density, but we're going expanding for vastly longer than it has already. Well, there are no others, it's like Mark